good to have you with us this morning. Um, we are currently in the Gospel of Matthew. <clears throat> that oasis picture, Mount Garfield, it's kind of interesting. You see all the water below it. It's like, wow, that's prophetic, maybe. Uh, if California goes under, it'll be oceanfront property here. So that'd be neat. Anyway, we are uh, looking at Matthew chapters 8 and 9. Uh, as we come into the last section here of Matthew 9, uh, he records the, the final two out of the ten miracles that are given to us in these two chapters. And they're very unique, very different, um, very powerful miracles that Jesus does. And again, we've seen that this is all for uh, demonstrating to the Jewish people. This is why Matthew writes. He's writing to the Jews, and he's writing these to prove to the Jewish people Jesus is our Messiah. And so that's the main reason why he quotes so much from the Old Testament in his gospel as well, saying Jesus has fulfilled all these prophecies concerning the, uh, the ministry, concerning Jesus the Messiah. So let's open up in a word of prayer, and we will pick up here in Matthew 9, 27. Father, we come before you, and once again, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you that we can come together to worship you, to lift your name up, to know, Lord, that you are for us, you're not against us. You love us, and you proved your love by sending Jesus into this world to die in our place. And so, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would stir us up to love and good works, and that we would have your compassion for a lost, dying world around us. And, Lord, we thank you for just these amazing um you know, scriptures that we have that you inspired uh, the disciple, the apostle Matthew to write. We thank you the Holy Spirit stirred him up to put these things down. And we pray that your living word would come alive within all of our hearts and minds. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so turn to Matthew 9. We, we've also seen that he is um, working from his home base, which is Capernaum or Capernaum. Uh, Capper means village. Nahum, some believe it was named after the prophet Nahum, but this was his home base in no north part of Israel around the Sea of Galilee for most of his three and a half years of earthly ministry. He did multitudes of miracles, healings, all kinds of amazing things in that region. Uh, it means village of Nahum. Nahum means uh, comforter. So Jesus made his home base the village of the comforter. And very apropos for Jesus, who brought lots of comfort and uh, compassion to this region. Uh, we pick up with Jesus having just raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. Uh, remember that Jairus was the ruler of the synagogue there in Caper uh, Capernaum. And he went to Jesus. He begged him to please come to his home. It, his 12-year-old daughter was on her deathbed. She was about to die. And so Jesus says, okay, I'll go. And he's going with uh, Jairus. And then they get interrupted by that woman who had the issue of blood for 12 years and she just wanted to touch the hem of his garment. And she knew if I just do that, I'll be healed. And she was. And Jairus is probably getting a little anxious. And by the time they get to Jairus' house, it's filled with all these professional mourners and weepers who know that she had died. And Jesus comes into the house and says, all right, she's just sleeping. She's not dead. And they all start to mock him and ridicule him. Hey, mister, we do this for a living. We know when somebody's dead. And so Jesus orders them out of the house, according to uh, Mark and Luke's gospel. And he brings in um, uh, Peter, James, and John into the home. And the two parents are there. And so he reaches down and touches her hand and says, Talitha kumai, or little girl, arise. And she instantly came to life. So in Luke chapter 8, 55, it says, Then her spirit returned. We looked at that, that she was literally dead, physically dead. And she arose immediately. And he commanded that she be given something to eat. And her parents were astonished. But he charged them to tell no one what had happened. And so look at Matthew 9, uh, 26. It says, the last thing we saw last week, and the report of this went out into all the land. 
In other words, how are you going to keep quiet about your 12-year-old daughter being raised from the dead? You, you, you can't keep that to yourself. I mean, of course, they're going to tell everybody what Jesus did for them. And so as Jesus is walking out of their home, he's going to be followed by these two blind men. Uh, they're probably thinking, well, if Jesus can raise somebody from the dead, I bet he can do something about our blind eyes. Maybe he can restore our sight. So we pick up in verse 27. When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. Now, why are they crying out, Son of David, have mercy on us? Because the, the title, Son of David, was a messianic term. It refers to a descendant of King David who would sit upon the throne forever. And it's a messianic term that speaks of the millennial reign of Christ. A thousand years when Jesus returns at a second coming, he's going to establish his kingdom, and he will take that place, that title, uh, the son of David. Now, there are many scriptures, especially in the book of Isaiah, that spoke about the glorious things the Messiah will do during this time when he rules and reigns on the earth not only will it be a tremendous time of healing and miracles taking place, but Jesus will turn this planet that has been devastated by the Great Tribulation, that seven-year period when God is pouring out His wrath. So here's the timeline. We're going to get raptured at any moment. Maybe today. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Maybe next week. Maybe. I, we don't know. The rapture could come at any moment. But once we're out of here, then according to 2 Thessalonians 2, then the Antichrist will be revealed. And he is going to come on with a peace plan, let the Jews rebuild their temple in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. Then it's going to be you know, chaos. He commits the abomination of desolation. Halfway into the seven-year period, says, Worship me, I'm God. And that's when Jesus tells us in Matthew 24, flee, get out of Jerusalem, head for the hills, pray that it's not on the Sabbath. It's the Jews that he's talking to in the Olivet Discourse. So God's going to pour out great tribulation, his wrath, his judgment upon planet Earth. We're going to be with the Lord during that seven-year period. Half the world's population will be destroyed. Just read Revelation 6 through 19, well, 18. That's the great tribulation. That's when God is sending judgment upon judgment upon this planet. Just two judgments with the fourth seal, I believe it is, when he opens up the first seven seals. A fourth of the world's population is destroyed. And then later on with one of the trumpet judgments in chapter 9, a third of those that remain will be destroyed. Just those two wipe out half the world's population. We're also told during that time frame, initially just a third of all the sea creatures, a third of all the freshwater supply is destroyed. And then a little later, all the sea creatures will be destroyed. All the trees will be burned up. All the grass will be burned up. And it won't matter how many trillions of dollars they pour into trying to save Mother Earth. Father God says it's toast. Very clearly. It's not going to be restored until Jesus returns at His second coming. Revelation chapter 19, and then starting in verse 11 to 15, we see Jesus returning. Those who are uh, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, which is you and me, we'll be following him on white horses. We'll get our uh, training, I guess, when we get to heaven, how to ride a horse. If you don't know how to do it, you'll learn. And we come back with the Lord. He's going to bring an end to the Antichrist reign. He's going to bring an end to the battle of Armageddon that's happening at that time. Then he's going to throw the Antichrist and his right-hand man, the false prophet, into the lake of fire that burns forever. But that's when he begins to establish his kingdom on earth that will last for 1,000 years. And so, why do I say all that? Because there's a lot of verses, especially in Isaiah, that speak of that thousand-year period. And that's when Jesus is the son of David, ruling at that time. These two blind men, that's what they're thinking. Okay, Jesus is doing all these things. This sounds like what's going to happen during the millennial reign of Christ. So, son of David, have mercy on us. That's what they're thinking. And so maybe Isaiah, look at these verses, Isaiah 35, they may have been thinking about this, verse 5, this is during the millennial reign, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. 
The ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. So I'm still waiting for that, because I can't sing. Anyway, for, the, for water shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. This has not yet happened. So again, that is what Jesus will do in the future when he reigns on the earth. So for this three and a half year period, 2,000 years ago, Jesus is giving us a foretaste of the kingdom of God. Remember John the Baptist, when he gets arrested, he's wondering, are you the one? In other words, are you establishing the kingdom of God? And, and Jesus tells him what he was doing, all these miracles. But it wasn't establishing the kingdom then, it's establishing the spiritual kingdom then, but the physical kingdom is still future. So that is what Jesus will do in the future. This is like a preview of coming attractions. Now, this is also why some Christians today get confused about healing and miracles today. They take all these Old Testament scriptures, speaking of the millennial reign of Christ or his three and a half year ministry, and they try to apply it to today. Does Jesus heal today? Yes. Can he cast out demons? I, uh, absolutely. We've seen him do this when we go up to Northeast India. I've been part of Go Give Hope for five years, and I've been over there four times, and we see amazing things that God does there. So yes, God can still do many signs and wonders, but... The number one thing that he wants us to do today deals with the number one problem in the world today, and it's not a physical problem, it's sin. Sin is what's destroying billions of people on planet Earth. So the gospel is the remedy. The gospel is the primary focus of Go Give Hope, of here, whatever we do, is to tell people the good news about Jesus Christ, because that is the solution is Jesus, the blood that he shed on the cross, the only acceptable payment for our sins. And so be careful not to try to take all these verses about the kingdom age and cram them into your, your present day theology. And then you get frustrated because, well, Jesus isn't doing what I thought he was going to do. No, you let Jesus be Jesus. He's God. You let him heal, you let him work, you let him do what he wants, how he wants, when he wants. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Just remember the, the Israelites. They saw miracles for 40 years, every single day. And yet for when they get to the promised land early on in that 40-year journey, God was giving them water from a rock, manna from heaven, pillar of fire, by night, a cloud to keep them cool in the day. Their little Teva sandals, it says, never wore out for 40 years. And they get to the edge of the promised land, and they did not enter in. Why? Because it says of their unbelief. Even though they saw miracle after miracle every single day. Faith does not come by seeing miracles. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Today we are to walk by faith and not by sight. Today we acknowledge Jesus can and he does heal the sick. He casts out demons. He can restore blind eyes. But we also acknowledge, like the Apostle Paul did, who wrote half the New Testament, that God is sovereign. Again, he does what he wants, when he wants. And Paul, who said, all things work together for good to those that love the Lord, to those that are called according to his purpose. That means even in your infirmity, even in your whatever it might be, God can work that together for good. He's got a bigger plan than something we might come up with. You know, Paul's the one who said God's grace was sufficient. Like Paul, he pleaded with the Lord three times that that um, infirmity, that thorn in his flesh, whatever it was, would be removed. And this is what Paul writes, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. It's up there, and he, the Lord, said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities, his weaknesses, his illnesses, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. That's important to realize, because so often we want him to do this, we want him to do that, and... His ways are higher than our ways. Again, these two blind men have great spiritual insight as they acknowledge Jesus is the promised son of David. Even though they're physically blind, 
And so they say, have mercy on us. Look at verse 28. And when he had come into the house, a blind man came to him. And Jesus said to them, do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said to him, yes, Lord. In other words, we do believe that you're able to heal us of our blindness. Verse 29. Then he touched their eyes and saying, according to your faith, let it be to you. Now, sometimes it is according to our faith. Sometimes we see Jesus healing people who had zero faith. Again, he's God. He's sovereign. He can do what he wants, how he wants. These men obviously had faith in Jesus. They believed he was the Messiah. And he says, okay, according to your faith, let it be to you. At other times, though, he will heal people who didn't even know who he was, who had zero faith at all. You know, there's a great example of this. Jesus comes to the pool of Bethesda, and it says there's multitudes of people who are lame, withered, blind. They were just crippled. I and mean, he goes through this whole list of all these infirmities people had. And it says they're sitting there waiting for an angel to stir up the waters of the pool. First one in gets healed. Well, here's a guy laid there for 38 years who's unable to walk, and I'm sure any time the water was stirred, somebody that had a headache is like, I'm in there first. And so this guy never got in. But that's what it says they were waiting for this. So check this out. Jesus comes and he says, do you want to be made well? He doesn't go to all the multitudes at that time and heal everybody. He just pull, you know, singles out this one guy. Do you want to be made well? And here's his response. Look at John chapter 5. Verse 7 and 8, the sick man answered him, Sir, in other words, he didn't even know who Jesus is. Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Again, he's, he's not exercising any faith. Jesus said to him, Arise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked, and that day was the Sabbath. It goes on to tell us, as you read that whole chapter, he still doesn't know who Jesus is, because the Pharisees are just like, why are you carrying your mat on the Sabbath? Well, somebody told me to pick it up and walk, and now I'm healed. Well, who was it? I don't know. I think he was a prophet. No, he can't be. And he starts getting in this debate with them. Eventually, he realizes who Jesus is. Notice it says in this passage, in Matthew 9, he touched their eyes. Again, no rhyme or reason how Jesus would heal people. My favorite one is when he goes to the guy and it says it was blind, and he spits on the ground. You know, I played a lot of baseball. We did a lot of spitting. And, you know, never once did anybody ever like, oh, let me make a little mud ball out of this and put it in a blind man's eye. But that's what he does. He spits in the ground, makes a little mud ball, sticks it in the guy's eyes, and then he says, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Well, of course, you just stuck mud in my eyes. I got to go wash my eyes. So he does, and then the guy's healed. Again, he does what he wants, how he wants, when he wants. We cannot make him do something for us, but we need to trust him to do what he knows is best for us. So the point is, we should never put Jesus in a box and tell him, this is how I want you to work in my life, Jesus. This is what I think you should do. Seriously? Like, Jesus needs our advice? I mean, I cannot picture Jesus going, oh, Jeff, why didn't I think of that? I should have done what you told me to do. Wow, your ways might be better than my ways. No, he would never do that. Verse 29, then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, let it be to you. Their eyes were open, and Jesus sternly warned them, saying, See that no one knows it. Yeah, that's not going to work. But when they departed... They spread the news about him in all that country. Again, don't tell everybody what I just did. Why does he do that? Well, we're told in John's gospel, he tells people this because he didn't want them to come and take him by force and make him king because his mission wasn't to be king. His mission was to go to the cross. The first time he came was the lamb of, the, uh, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. At his second coming, he'll be the lion of the tribe of Judah, and then he will conquer all the enemies on earth. So the first time, he says, don't tell everybody, but they couldn't help themselves. I mean, how are you going to keep this to yourself? And I can only imagine these two formerly blind men at this moment 
now they see, I mean, these guys are probably best friends, hanging around each other. They watched over each other. They looked out for one another. They probably took care of each other the best they could. But now their eyes are opened at the same time. And now they see each other probably for the first time, and, and especially in a whole new way. I wonder if they just kind of looked at each other and just like started laughing. Like, can you believe this? We can see. And just hanging out over the years, like watch the sunset go down. Can you imagine we were blind, but now we can see this. What grace, what mercy. Jesus is so good. I still can't understand why he would do this. I mean, I can certainly relate to this story in some ways because growing up in San Diego, I was as spiritually blind as you could be. My best friend Rob was equally blind, spiritually speaking, but we were also very close. For a lot of years, we did everything together. We started off as rivals way back in Little League days. Uh, he was the best hitter in the league, and I was the best pitcher in the league. Uh, it's crazy because he, he was really good, and he was hitting like 600 or something in Little League. He had 12 straight base hits at one time. It was a record. I don't know if it still stands. but it's, I mean, not just hitting the ball, but 12 base hits. I stopped his streak, so I'd rub it in his nose. But then he always reminds me, yeah, but my next hit was off of you too. So <laughs> he got me back. But eventually we became best friends. In high school, we hung out together. We took all the same classes. We surfed together. We were teammates at San Diego State together, and we always had each other's back. He'd always know how to pick me up when I was down and vice versa. And then when I got kicked off the team midway through my junior year, he was the one that was right there, you know, and I got kicked off for good reasons. I was doing a lot of bad stuff. But he was getting really worried about me because of the direction I was going. I was falling off the cliff in a hurry. But he was there. He came alongside of me, and uh, it's kind of like these two guys. You know, we were like the blind leading the blind. Um, we were both very angry. I was angry at the coach for kicking me off the team, even though I was one of the best pitchers at that time. And he was so angry, Rob quit the team. He ended up going to another, we both got scholarships to another university. He took it, and I ended up going to Bible school as results. All things work together for good, but at the invitation of our teammate, one I used to pick on and make fun of all the time, Ron Tarter, he was a really on fire Christian. He invited us to uh, Calvary Chapel, San Diego, that night, November 30th, 1977. Um, <laughs> So stupid. <laughs> you know, Pastor Mike's given the invitation. You know, he preaches the gospel. And I even at one point turned to Ron, who is the born again Christian, said, Why'd you tell this guy about me? He knows everything about me. Because I don't know him. There's 1,500 people in his auditorium. I don't know him. But everything Mike said, just preaching the gospel, Jesus loves you. He died for you. You're a sinner. You're separated from God. You just need to come to Christ. And he gave an invitation. Rob and I, we never talked much. We we're just best friends, but we just like grunt. You know, just, you know, that's, we could do that all day long. You want to go eat? Uh, that was it. Until I met Elizabeth, and I realized, you actually have to communicate with other people. <laughs> that was tough. But, so Rob and I, we just kind of looked at each other. You know, when he gave the invitation, we want to receive Christ. And we looked at it, just nodded, and we both went forward and accepted the Lord together. Spiritual brothers. <laughs> it was awesome. We were blind, so blind, but immediately our eyes were open. Like these two blind men who could now see, they couldn't keep Jesus to themselves. Rob and I, we could not keep Jesus to ourselves. And it's funny because we told a lot of people what, you know, what just happened, and a lot of them were like, well, good, we've been praying for you two jerks for a long time. <laughs> And finally, our prayers were answered. And then other people we thought were our friends, we told them, we just accepted Christ. And they didn't want anything to do with us after that again. It was pretty amazing. But when you've experienced, like these two men, God's grace, and you're now walking in the love of Christ, and the Holy Spirit is dwelling in your heart, it's really hard to keep Jesus to yourself. Verse 32, As they went out, behold... They brought to him a man, mute and demon-possessed. So again, these two formerly blind men leave, all excited, rejoicing in the Lord. And, and the they, nobody's really sure. You see different things. Was it the blind men that bring this guy 
to Jesus or just they as another people brought these guys to this guy to Jesus. Anyway, he's mute, unable to speak, probably demon, because of the demon possession. Verse 33 says, When the demon was cast out, the mute spoke. And the multitudes marveled, saying, It was never seen like this in Israel. Again, a lot of people in the house, around the house, Jesus, you know, commands the demon to leave. He has to leave. Jesus has that authority, and the demons must obey. Notice that the people are just blown away by what Jesus is doing. It's never been like this in Israel. I mean, they're just thinking, this is amazing. And they're right. Nothing was like this, like this has ever been done in Israel. 800, 900 years earlier, yeah, there's a little bit of this with Elijah, the prophet. God used him to do some miracles. Then Elisha, his protege, he did some miracles. You go back 1,500 years from Jesus, and again, all that God did with Moses, getting him out of Egypt, all the miracles for 40 years. But nothing was ever like this, you know, going on where such a concentration for three and a half years of blind eyes open, Ears open, mouth speaking, demons cast out, lepers cleansed. It says multitudes of people healed, diseases healed. I mean, everything. And dead people raised from the dead? I mean, yeah, that's why they say nothing like this has ever happened before. This is what the Apostle John says at the end of his gospel concerning all this. In John 20, verse 30, it says, And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe. This is why we have this record, so that we would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And then the very last thing John writes in John 21, verse 25, he says, And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. I mean, really, that's what these four Gospels are all about. The Holy Spirit inspired Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, to write these things down, Matthew and John obviously were eyewitnesses. Mark got most of his information from Peter. Luke interviewed everybody to put his gospel account down. And this is why they gave us the gospels, to show us why Jesus came. To demonstrate the love of God, to die on the cross for our sins, to shed his blood so we could be cleansed and forgiven. It would mean nothing unless Jesus rose from the dead. And because he rose from the dead, he can offer the free gift of eternal life to anybody who will put their faith alone in Christ alone. And this is why I love John 3, 16 and 17 so much. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Perish means to be destroyed. He doesn't want you destroyed, but he wants to give you everlasting life. Verse 17 says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world. He didn't come here 2,000 years ago to condemn us, but to save us. He didn't come to condemn the world, but to save the world. Uh, again, but that the world through Him might be saved. One of the saddest things there is is when people cannot see the truth of who Jesus is, the truth of why He came. So everybody's not excited about what Jesus is doing. Most people were, but there's these religious leaders, the Sadducees, the Pharisees. Check out verse 34. It says, But the Pharisees said, He casts out demons by the ruler of the demons. Wow. They finally acknowledge Jesus is doing miracles, but they attribute the miracles that he's doing to Satan working through him, Satan giving him the power who are these blind people in this chapter? Well, the two blind guys recognize Jesus as the Messiah. He opens their eyes. These guys have open eyes, but they're more blind than anybody. Thinking Jesus is in cahoots with Satan. That's why this is happening. Jesus is just a stooge for Satan. So they are more blind than anybody because of what they're saying about Christ. As we've seen, everything Jesus did was because of the Holy Spirit working in him, working through him. 
When he was at his baptism, the Holy Spirit came upon him, and that's when his earthly ministry began. And so it's very, very dangerous to attribute what Jesus is doing to the power of Satan. And why are these guys doing this? Because they're trying to turn people away from Christ. And in a few chapters, we'll see that Jesus will accuse these religious leaders of committing the unpardonable sin which is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. This is what he says in Matthew 12, verse 31. Jesus is answering their false accusation that he's casting out these demons by the ruler of the demons, Beelzebub. Therefore, Jesus speaking here, Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man... It will be forgiven him. I take great comfort in that because I used to curse Jesus. I would pick on these Christians that were on our team. I would you know, cuss them out. I would tell them what idiots they were and use a lot of words that are no longer acceptable. And I know what I deserve. But here Jesus says, anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. So why is Jesus speaking so strongly concerning the Holy Spirit? Because the Holy Spirit is the one who draws people to Jesus. The Holy Spirit is the one who points people to Jesus. He's the one that convicts us of our sin, John 16, 8. He came into the world to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And, and so, bottom line is, if people continually reject Jesus, they are rejecting the Holy Spirit, their hearts become hard and calloused. The unpardonable sin is when somebody dies without Jesus as their Lord and Savior. It's in this life only. Before you die, you have to make a decision for Christ. Are you going to receive Him or are you going to reject Him? The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is when you say, I don't want anything to do with Jesus, even though I did that many years. For a lot of times I said, I don't want anything to do with Him. But when the conviction of the Holy Spirit finally broke through and opened up my eyes to see who Christ was, who I was without Christ, then I simply surrendered my life to Jesus. He came into my life and He saved me for all of eternity. But if you die without Jesus, you are lost forever. Our neighbors to the west of us, the whole state almost, they say, oh no, you can die. And in the next life we can pray, a proxy prayer, and we can bring you into the kingdom of God. It doesn't work that way, folks. That's a lie from the pit of hell. It's in this life only you have to make a decision. Look at Hebrews chapter 9, verses 27 and 28. It says, As it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. So hopefully you're eagerly waiting for Him to come for you. It's for salvation, to receive our resurrection bodies. We're saved now, but we're not glorified yet, obviously. Just look in the mirror. <laughs> you're like, uh, it's going to get better, right? Yeah, it's going to get a lot better. <laughs> Trust me. So these Pharisees were walking on very thin ice. And unless they repented... Unless they turned to Christ before they died, they would be lost forever. Look at verse 35. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. So you think Jesus is intimidated by these Sadducees, these Pharisees? Absolutely not. He didn't give a rip about what they were saying and these false accusations. He didn't care what they thought of him because Jesus was all about doing the Father's work. He was revealing the heart of the Father to all these hurting, desperate, broken-hearted, you know, downtrodden men and women of Israel. Do you know who is also learning these valuable lessons about serving God, not listening to the opposition? 
Well, the 12 disciples, we'll see next time they're called the apostles, and they're taking very close, paying very close attention to what Jesus is doing. They're listening to everything he's saying, he's, everything he's preaching. It would take a while for them to fully understand, not until after the day of Pentecost, that apart from Christ, they could do nothing. Through Christ, they could do all things, because it was Christ who empowered them, who strengthened them. But it's only because the same Holy Spirit who is working in Jesus would also be working in their lives. And guess what? The same Holy Spirit that worked in Jesus and worked in the disciples is also working in and through us. Amazing. He came into your life the very moment you got saved. The promise Jesus gave His disciples just before he ascended back up into heaven. It's just as valid for you and me today. Again, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, very clear. But you, this is when Jesus tells them, wait in Jerusalem till you're endued with power from on high. And I first heard that when I was a baby Christian surfer. I was like, dude? What do you mean, dude? No, you have to wait till you're endued. Not that you're a dude, but you have to wait till you're endued with power from on high. So anyway. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses. Take note of that word, witnesses. The Greek word is martis, where we get the word for martyr. It means you're going to be a living martyr for me. And most of them, except for John, would die horrible deaths as martyrs. But we're all a martyr for Christ. We're dead to ourselves, alive to Jesus. So you should be witnesses to me, in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And, and we see how this all played out in the book of Acts, as those early disciples proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Jew first, also to the Gentiles, and part of being filled with the Holy Spirit also meant they had boldness to stand against the opposition that would say, you can't tell people about Jesus here, we don't want you talking about Jesus in the streets of Jerusalem. We don't want you talking to, about Jesus in your school or your workplace. We're going to get you in trouble. So this is all, again, very applicable for us today. Acts chapter 4, verse 18. This is when John and Peter get arrested by these religious leaders. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. Ever feel like you want to say that today? For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. They're just testifying of Jesus, who he is, what he's done for them. Then in Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 27, they re-arrest Peter and John. First time they just threaten them. This time they will beat them. But they arrest them a second time. And this is what it says in verse 27. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. The high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. That's a good thing all about Jesus, and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. A little conviction there. Him God has exalted to the right hand to be Prince and Savior. So he raised from the dead. This is the gospel in a nutshell. He died on the cross, hung on a tree. He rose from the dead, and it's to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. That's you and me today. And we're certainly living in similar days of opposition to the gospel of Christ as these guys were 2,000 years ago. So we also need to walk in the boldness and the power of the Holy Spirit. So here's Jesus. Notice again, it says he's teaching, he's preaching, and he's healing. And this is the second time Matthew links these three things together that Jesus is doing. Here's the first one we saw, Matthew 4, 23. 
And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. And once again, these three components are three important components when it comes to ministry. Teaching, preaching, and ministering to the people's needs. And that can come to play in a lot of different ways. Teaching is my primary ministry. We teach the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Ephesians 4, 11, this is where Paul gives us the various offices in the church, ministries. This is what they're for. And he himself, the Lord himself, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, by the way, Ephesians 2.20 says that the church has been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus being the chief cornerstone. So I can make a very good argument that this type of apostolic ministry is done because you don't build on another foundation with another foundation. Present-day apostles would be missionaries. The, the word means those sent forth. So that's what we do in India. We're sending forth these young men and women to take the gospel to these unreached places. Be that as it may, he says, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. That, again, that's my office. And here's the reason why God gives us these offices. For the equipping of the saints, that's you guys, it's all of us for the work of ministry, for the edifying or the building up of the body of Christ. And so teaching God's Word systematically, exp you know, expositionally, equips you for doing the ministry God calls you to do. That's my main role. It's, it's a body. I'm not the head of this body. Jesus is. I'm just doing what He called me to do, and if we're all doing what He calls us to do, as your faith is being strengthened, as you spend time, not just here on Sunday, but throughout the week, you're in the Word, you're seeking the Lord. He'll open up opportunities for you to use your gifts and talents in so many different ways. So that's the first thing, teaching. The second thing we see here Jesus doing is preaching the gospel. Teaching is primarily for the body of Christ. Preaching is primarily for the unsaved. Preaching the gospel, the good news, is what unbelievers out in the world need to hear. That Jesus came from heaven to earth. He lived a perfect life. It was because he had to die as the perfect sacrifice for our sins because God requires blood. You know how it goes. And then he rose from the dead. That's the gospel in a nutshell. And if you come to Christ, he will forgive you. He will give you eternal life. Romans 1.16 Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. And so again, the gospel is preached when we are telling others the good news of Jesus. Now, the third thing we see Jesus doing here is he's meeting their physical needs. He's, in that case, he was healing. He was ministering to those who were going through all these different physical infirmities. He met their personal lead, needs. He delivered them from demonic oppression. He fed them. Remember with the little boy's lunchable? Oh, how are we going to feed all these people, Jesus? Well, you figure it out. And the little guy came to him, had a couple of fish, a couple of loaves of bread. Jesus blessed, multiplied, fed 5,000 men, plus their wives, plus their kids. Probably 15,000, 20,000 people get stuffed. They have their Thanksgiving stretchy pants on when they're done. And they're just like, oh, man. And so he met their needs in different ways. These are the same three components of ministry we still use today. Teach the Word, preach the Gospel and try to minister to people's personal needs. You know, this is why we do the, the, the homeless shelter park outreach, trying to meet their needs, give them a meal, then share Jesus with them. We've certainly seen Jesus heal people. I've seen him, I know he healed me many years ago of a situation I was going through. Um, we still see this in our church planters, especially in India, but they also look for practical things to do. 
And it's not just the miracles that will open up the door for the gospel. And that's the only reason why God did these miracles, so that it would open up a door for people to bring in the gospel. We see this when we go into these villages. Our church planners will go in. Sometimes they'll be, a, you know, the chief of the village. They still have chiefs and all these little weird things going on there. And oftentimes you'll hear about the chief's, you know, wife or the chief's son. You know, they'll be really ill. And they'll go in and say, hey, can I pray for your wife or your son or daughter? And they've seen God heal them. And the next thing you know, the whole village, the doors open, share the gospel, the whole village gets saved. It's awesome. There's other times they'll go in and, you know, they might pray for somebody that's sick, nothing happens, but they notice, okay, all these kids are sick. What's going on here? And this is what Emily started like 20 years ago when he, well, he's from there, but he started building these freshwater wells because the kids are eating, drinking all this bad water. And so they dig, dig the wells. Now they get fresh water. The kids are getting better. And they're like, Wow. What's all this about? And so that opened up the door to share the gospel. Whole village gets saved. So there's a lot of different things God can do. Um, we're going to live stream with some of the church planners over there. So let's say Emily is the captain of Go Give Hope. Well, Jesus is the ultimate. But Jesus, say Emily is the captain. So he's got four lieutenants over in northeast India. And we're going to be live streaming with those four guys. They're amazing. Shamish, he ministers to the former Muslims there. He personally has led over 2,500 Muslims to Jesus. Just one-on-one, -on -one, Shamish. So he'll be there, not there, live stream. Um, come soon, he is with Karbi Anglong tribe. And he, many of the pictures you see of our church planners, they're from the Karbi Anglong tribe. And some of these guys have been doing this for 20 years when Emily first went there. And it's awesome. These guys are fearless. We give them 40 bucks a month. Well, you do. You know, to support them. That 40 bucks a month, I mean, that pays for them not to have to work, but they can just go to all these villages and talk about Jesus and win people of the Lord. It's awesome. Um, so we'll talk with Cam soon. And then we'll also talk to um, Onan and Britta. Onan is like Emily's right hand man. They're from the same Ao tribe up in Nagaland. And they run the Christian school that we support their teachers and the kids to go there because they are ministering to the Amri Karbi tribe. The Amri Karbi are not recognized as a people group in India. Indian government wish they would just be annihilated, go away. And yet there's probably about 200,000 Amri Karbi people. So they get no schooling, they get no roads, they get nothing from the Indian government because they look at them as basically lower than dogs. So we have a Christian school, and the kids are being ministered there. And then Onan, um, and, and this is all just from all your generosity. You know, we opened up a, a vocational training school for this Garo tribe, another tribe there, and these men are getting trained to do work, and they're learning how to build, build houses, fix things. You know, there, most of the houses are made out of bamboo walls. And it's, it's pretty awesome, though. But God's opened up all these doors for these guys to be trained, led to Christ. And then now they're serving with Onan. And he's getting all these contracts that other places aren't getting because he'll go in like half the cost. He's using it as a training thing. And they'll paint a building, a government building or whatever. It's been amazing. That's how doors are opened. And the I'll tell you what, the Garo tribe... The women, the wives are excited because for the last probably 80 years or so, the men have never worked in the Garo tribe. Thanks to our British friends who came in and they took all the men to battle and most of them died. And so then when they went back, the ones that didn't die, the wives were told, you work, you just take care of your husband. Well, that's now a generational thing. Some of you guys are thinking, well, this would be awesome. I want to live there. It's not a good thing because the wives are doing all the work. The guys just sit around. And so this training, vocational training school, is getting these guys to learn how to work. And it's been amazing. So God can do what he wants, how he wants, the way he wants. We just need to be open to whatever God has for us. All right, let's wrap it up. Verse 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And this is still valid today. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. 
Did you notice a word here? It's really the most important ingredient, you might say, when it comes to ministry. He had, what, compassion for the lost, hurting, desperate people. Compassion. We need God's love in action. That's basically a great way to summarize compassion. God's love in action. To be able to see people the way Jesus sees them. That has been one of my prayers for many, many years, is Lord, help me to see people through your eyes. Because if I just look through my natural eyes at people, I'll, I can size them up and judge them and, you know, oh, God doesn't care about them. And no, when you see people through his eyes, then you're able to have compassion for them. Because here it says he sees them. They're weary. They're worn out. Why were they weary and worn out? Because of their political situation in Israel at that time. The Roman Empire was ruling, and they were putting heavy burdens on the people. And that was one of the reasons they were so worn out. Sound familiar? Why are there so many people scattered, wandering aimlessly? You look at our cities now, and people just look lost. They're walking around with their mask on like zombies because they don't have a shepherd pointing them to the chief shepherd, Jesus. They're running on empty. It's because Jesus was moved with compassion that he sends his laborers into his harvest to bring in his sheep. And guess what? The harvest is still plentiful. He wants all of us to be moved with compassion. We'll pick up on this because there's no chapters and verses when this was written. It'll keep going into chapter 10 because Jesus says, okay, you guys, I want you to start praying. Praying that the Lord will raise up workers to go out into the harvest field. And so they'll do that. Then they'll come back. And he goes, guess what? I heard your prayers, and I'm sending you. Be careful what you pray for. 